Hey guys, what's up? Oh, we got a foggy lens. It is humid today. Let me try to fix that. Is that better? I think that's a little bit better. All right, how's everybody doing today? Um, you know, this video, I want to kind of get at the heart of what the channel is about, which is messy hairdos. No, which is, uh, if you were to get inside of your fish tanks and peer out at the world, and say you're a fish confined, locked away in this fish tank, and you look at all the things around you in the fish tank, and you look at the big noisy water maker, and you look at the scary water bubbler uh, that has air coming out of it and hissing, and then you look down at the, the gravel that looks like clown vomit. No, none of my tanks have the, the crazy uh, psychedelic <laughs> rainbow uh, gravel. But... That stuff comes from somewhere, and I'm not making fun of people who want to have a crazy decked out uh, tank with lots of decor and stuff. I'm just trying to make the point that your filter, your air stone, the stone or pumice, or uh, whether it's synthetic, all of that comes from somewhere, and we have to pay for it. I mean, I would assume you have to pay for it or steal it, and it has to travel, and it has to get into our tanks. Some of us live in super remote places. I mean, I know that we have viewers living down in Tasmania, and not to say that it's the middle of nowhere, but it geologically, it, it, geographically, it is so far from the United States or a lot of places where you may source some of the products that you're using, or Europe, for instance. So today, I just kind of want to, we can talk about whatever, but at the beginning, I wanted to throw out some stuff. Um, for thought, some food for thought on the things that affect the pricing of our tanks, but maybe more importantly, yeah, much more importantly on a human scale, I want to discuss the things that are going on in these regions where we get our fish from and how they control the hobby and how we can choose through what we buy or where we buy it, how the impact changes for people. So the first and most common thing, uh, and hello everybody as you filter in, I know that usually these live streams kind of take a minute to get rolling as people filter in and get alerts and whatnot. Um, so hello, uh, Louis uh, Segura and, or Lou Segura, Goose Not Maverick, Rico, Digado, uh, and all y'all filtering in. So what I want to talk about, though, is something, for instance, like Celestial Pearl Danios. They're a fish that has been so popular, so everyone loves them, right? I mean, well, a lot of people like them in the freshwater community. And did we have Celestial Pearl Danios in our hobby, I don't know, when I was a teenager? No. Did we have, I mean, before 2006, we as a Western society didn't know that they existed, okay? So why is that? Well, I mean, there's several factors. They're from a remote region called Shan uh, on Lake Inle uh, in Myanmar, known as Burma to a lot of English speakers. This was once a British colony and then handed over to the people and became a dictatorship and a very, very private country. And uh, in the Shan region, it's still semi-autonomous. So this is in between, uh, you've got, I guess, well, I should have a map, right? I should get a map for these things. But basically, you've got uh, Bangladesh on one side, you've got uh, Cambodia there, Thailand, and then uh, not too far away up, you've got Laos, and if you go farther, it's not connected, but Vietnam. And so this region was notoriously known for producing opium, which was then uh, converted into heroin. So what does this have to do with your fish? Follow me. So we go to war with Afghanistan, the United States, and uh, the Coalition of the Willing, and we go to war with Afghanistan, and we decimate the Taliban's supply of opium at the very beginning of the war, right? Well, this means someone has to fill the market. 
and there's a limited amount of places that are tooled to have cartels to distribute these drugs and uh, militias to fight off governments and things where these are. So you've got a couple options of where the heroin could start coming from. You've got places like Colombia or Venezuela, uh, also dictator in Venezuela, arguably. Uh, I don't want to get into, like, whether you love Trump, hate Trump, whether you hate Obama, love Obama, pro-war, anti-war on each situation we could ch chat about. I just want to show cause and effect. Um, and you can argue that maybe one thing's good and it has 20 bad things and I'm not focusing on the bad things. Well, I'm just talking about the fish here and a line of thinking. And I just want you to maybe think bigger in your everyday life and, and, and consider the impact of things that we do and research where yourself comes from because one, I think it's fascinating and that's what this channel is here to do is I learn and I share what I'm learning or stuff I've learned long ago. Let's get back to Afghanistan. So war's going crazy in Afghanistan. We are secretly letting warlords uh, sell heroin to Europe but um, or drugs, uh, opium raw coming out through Afghanistan and through the north. Uh, through uh, terror down the southern route through Iran and then south and then to the west or north into the west. And this route uh, is the, the northern uh, coalition, the northern alliance, whatever you want to call them, uh, who were anti Taliban warlords um, who tried to rule after the Russians. So you could go all the way back to the Russians or the Mongols. You can take this as far back as you want, why war started there. But let's just get to it. So heroin starts getting sold in Afghanistan. That's a huge region. The Taliban comes to power because of heroin. That's what gives them their money to buy their guns and uh, all their influence and, uh, you know, social things like uh, Islam that's already established. They're allowed or they're able to exploit uh, facets of that. But Let's let's move away from that. I know that's a trigger point, and a lot of people have different feelings about that. And it's not important in this situation. I'm just just throwing it out there as the context of how this happened. Of course, most of you know this, so I was hoping it would be a familiar thing. And you're wondering what does Afghanistan and 9/11 have to do with CPDs or Celestial Pearl Daniels, Galaxy Rasboras, Erythromicrons, uh, Rummy Nose uh, Rasboras, the orange ones. Uh, not the Rummy Nose Tetras, all those are from Lake Inle, uh, and, or the, the region, the Shan Basin. And this region picked up the slack while Afghanistan was a war zone, while we initially came in, burned poppy crops, pulled up poppy crops, um, people were busy fighting and not growing things, and so while Europe still had a supply, the rest of Asia, India, Pakistan, and, you know, uh, Australia, New Zealand, their supply was dwindling, and so who comes in to fill the void? The 1970s, the Gold Golden Triangle, who used to be the world's top producers of heroin in the Shan State, in Myanmar, who actually happened to be, there's several, several groups, but one of them is a Maoist, so supported by the Chinese uh, undercover. Um, they are supported by the Chinese, and they... Uh, are fighting this uh, fascist dictatorship that Burma is is having. There's also kind of this uh, socialist, fascist, weird dictatorship going on in Burma. It's it's called the Junta or Junta. Um, you can read about it. It's it's a very bizarre um, thing that happened. Same within Cambodia in the 70s. You have Pol Pot into the 80s. But what was happening is. Um, you know, that region all of a sudden got really violent again from 2002 to 2004 or 5. Well, Afghanistan, deals are made, the Taliban and the locals start to grow opium poppies all over again. And it actually turns out that by 2006, 2007, there are more opium poppies being grown than ever before in Afghanistan. And the world's supply of heroin is backlogged. There's you know, literally metric tons of heroin stocked up. So the Shan region also happens to be going through, uh, the people want democracy, and the world has been pressuring uh, Myanmar, Burma, 
uh, to become more democratic, to open up to the West, to allow more travelers and, uh, you know, pressure all around them. There's democratic or republic, uh, you know, states all around them. And basically, by 2006, they start opening up some of these regions and some intrepid explorers um, decide to go and go into the far regions of where uh, a lot of these areas up certain river valleys and things like that, Westerners simply could not go without an invitation from a warlord or a local chieftain or however it's structured, there's different setups in different areas. But because of that, 2006 is a crazy year, and we find 29 new Danio species, Brachiodanio and Danio, a bunch of Rasboras. That's why the Galaxy Rasbora, or AKA uh, CPD Celestial Pearl Danio, Danio Marginatus, uh, that's why it was confused. It was in the field, they're like, look at this little fish, it's sparkly, it's probably. Yeah, it looks kind of like an, a lamb chop rasbor or SB rasbor or something like that. Let's call it that for a while. And so it gets back to the United States. It's easy to breed, actually. And so while they're being caught in the wild, Lake Inlay is also getting all built up. And there's, uh, there's floating farms on this lake, which is kind of what happened in Mexico City, too. And May... Uh, Maybe there's some even similarities of what we'll see with Goodyads uh, in Mexico, because a lot of the Goodyads live in areas outside of Mexico City, which was built on a lake, and it is built on floating uh, farms, which have now turned into solid ground, but have springs running through them, and there's actually an underwater polluted lake as well. And some of these places are where there are, you can only find some of these species in those places. However, Mexico has also picked up the slack now that the Golden Triangle is not producing heroin. So, or less heroin. So now Mexico is producing the bulk of heroin coming to the United States, which is the biggest market in the world uh, for those things, Canada and the United States, and uh, as well as cocaine that they're bringing out of Southern uh, South America. And all of the sudden, we don't have access to certain uh, parts of Mexico, you know, or if you go, you're kind of a cowboy, you know, and logistically it's challenging. If you want to find a new fish and bring it back from an area, say it's a peaceful part of the Peruvian Amazon where there's a town that specializes in exporting fish, it's still challenging, still whatever it is, one in three or one in two fish are going to die before they get out. But try getting on a jeep where you have to check in with warlords and checkpoints and different villages as you get farther and farther into places uh, or different corrupt officials, getting a license if that exists there or permission to collect fish, getting out unharmed in 110 degree weather with the fish aerated in the right pH without ammonia building up, all these things and get it back to a distrib distribution center of some sort that can fly it out on a normal plane, which usually you'll have to, in the bush, you'll have to fly from some place in the Amazon or in uh, Thailand or something like that. They'll have to catch like a bush plane or a small plane from a town that's under 50,000 people. They'll fly that back to a main hub, a main exporter. Uh, one sec, let me grab the info because I actually was chatting with the people at Seagrest, at Imperial, and at 5D, and a few other places, and asking them, how remote are the fish that you get sometimes? Like, you know, how do you get fish that take five days to get out of the water? Um, you know, how do you do that and um, get them to America, you know? And let alone if there's some sort of conflict of interest between the countries. So my point being that Celestial Pearl Daniels, we wouldn't even know about them. Possibly you could look at it as if the Taliban hadn't been, if their amount of heroin uh, production hadn't been decreased, uh, and then all of a sudden spiked up in increase, we may not know about the Celestial Pearl Daniel. It's just like food for thought. 
So that's one kind of like out there, and I know you're watching my channel because maybe you have an interest in this, but that's one out there example of it with a long chain that probably was boring. And now that we have people in, in, the, in the chat, let me take a sec to say hello. Uh, wow, somebody had a name that got deleted that was extremely vulgar, and I have no idea how they were able to have that name. Uh, Red on Betsy, you rock. Bob and Betsy, my intrepid uh, admins, you guys rock. Peter, what is up, buddy? Jason, hello. Hello. Um, Chubby Guppy, what up? Derek, uh, 186. Guppy Puppies. I love saying that. Guppy Puppy, Guppy Puppy, Guppy Puppy. Um, and Bob, Mr. Science Geek. Uh, names I can't say, Sean Gardner, uh, Kaler's Aquatic, that's Bob. Uh, so, in any case, if you haven't yet, check out Bob's channel. He keeps so many friggin' cool fish, and he has, like, a glut of fry right now that are just really cool to check out. I, I love just watching him raise them because I don't have the space right now, but hopefully soon. All right, so... That was an extreme version that I just wanted as food for thought. Like, so this fish gets discovered by two people in, uh, so Lake Inlay has had tourists coming and going more and more the last 20 or 30 years. But before that, it was really extreme travelers if you were from the U.S. Now, some European countries have different um, relationships with those countries, and it makes it easier. So that's why a lot of fish go to Germany like Dennerle or Aquarium Glazer, uh, and then they come to the U.S. because simply they don't like Americans there or uh, they may have um, lack of trust, you know, with American explorers. Like, what are you doing here? Are you CIA or, you know, whatever, by these militias and things. Same with Papua New Guinea. Uh, you know, people like uh, Gary Lang um, and... Uh, Alan and uh, who else is in, in the crew? Um, uh, Wim. Uh, anyways, you guys can look up all the people that go on these amazing adventures. But, uh, you know, going through into places like Sudan, like Lawrence Kent, he happens to be in my local um, fish club. And he is a volunteer worker for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So that is why he's in Africa, in these really hard-to-reach places. And on his day off, so to speak, he gets to go look for fish, like cichlids and stuff. And it's people like that um, from the West that are able to bring these new species in. So now, say you've got the species, it's here, and it's really hard to breed. If you can get locals to catch that species and it's sustainable, uh, which it's not a lot of times. Um, and we should, we should be aware of that. You know, we shouldn't contribute to overfishing of certain fish. And it's hard to know when there's no one there to do a big survey of what exists in the region. But, you know, South Sudan is the newest nation in the world. And so it's been war torn for years. Again, you have uh, state run militias and uh, armies. So you've got the Southern Army, you've got the uh, African Union of Troops. You've also got uh, psychos, I'm, I'm going to take a position on this, with like the Lord's Resistance Army or um, the, uh, the Al-Ansar Muslim fighters up in Mali and down in, they get into Sudan and some of those areas now. Um, so you have all these things going on, but it's really unstable in those areas. And so they bring back things like cribs, and it's really important that those people who bring them back uh, sell or give away or whatever, but breed those in captivity. And hopefully we can do that and stay out of some of those areas. However, you need to add new blood to the bloodline of these fish or they get really inbred. Now, a lot of times they've gone extinct in war zones and things like that. Um, one of my favorite fish, the clown killi or the rocket killi, is found in Liberia and Sierra Leone. Now, Sierra Leone and, and specifically uh, Liberia had a horrendous civil war that lasted uh, quite some time. Uh, there were normal civil wars and then it just fractioned into a failed state for a while. And I'm talking people 
burning every inch of farmland in in certain towns, killing everybody, you know, um, over a million people dying. Um, and in the West, we don't always hear about a ton of these things. Maybe you do. I don't know. But uh, surprising how little people know that, la you know, since September 11th, uh, they, they figure um, uh, World Aid Watch uh, organization that tracks conflict zones and re uh, refugee numbers and things, they figure that somewhere around 10 million people have been killed uh, by violent actions uh, in by paramilitary groups or military actions in the entire world uh, in the last uh, 20 years. And that's a, a very conservative number. So. so, you know, with fish, who wants to risk going to the Congo? Now, there's spots in the Congo you can definitely go to. I have friends who've been there and everything. But who wants to risk going there and getting murdered to get a puffer fish, you know, that can sell for $200 here? $200 may seem like a lot, but if you think about the journey that that fish makes and the fact that if a puffer comes out of water, it can expand and then die, like it can kill itself that way. You have to drain its air bladder. And I mean, there's all sorts of other things like worms and heat and deoxygenation. You know what I mean? The oxygen's gone because <laughs> they're traveling. Uh, all these crazy things that go on in these areas without infrastructure. So that's one whole chunk that we could do an endless series on. I mean, there's conflicts in Yemen and obviously Iraq. I'm finding that the, the, the species of Babalti shrimp that I have uh, with the most color, the video I just put out the other day, uh, that are not the Indian Babaltis. They actually are Egyptian and Iraqi, two places that also are not the most stable in the world right now. So those were brought out about 20 years ago into uh, the East Asian trade. So Taiwan, Thailand, um, Singapore, and Indonesia, some of those countries that really like to breed shrimp and nano fish. And so now they've, they've uh, entered the U.S. via that way, but we, we, would, we may be hard pressed to go through those areas. And there's uh, an incredible documentary, there's several I'm sure, but there's one that was really good written on the marsh Arabs, marsh as in like a swampy marsh and Arab as in Saudi Arabia, that live in Iraq. And it's a small area that was dammed by Saddam Hussein. And uh, basically he starved these people out of their way of life, which was living on boats and woven mats in these marshes. And some of that has been restored, but there's still all this conflict ethnically and in the vacuum of, uh, I mean, even though uh, Saddam Hussein was a monster, um, there was a level of stability there for about 20 years. He did his worst. They kind of relocated, readjusted. They were oppressed, but they, they were there. And then there were other groups like some of the Shia militias and things down there that came in and... Uh, uh, actually, some people argue that there's been a genocide against them. There's um, everything from Coptic Christians to different sects of Saudi Arabians and things. But my point is, the shrimp that I have that I just did a video on, I'm not, I didn't talk about all that, but somehow they made it out of a war zone over to Asia, were refined in Asia, bred for the strongest ones, the prettiest ones, whatever, and then they make it here. It's incredible that I can buy them for even $10 a piece to me. That blows my mind, you know? But I'm going to breed them, and then I'll sell them, and maybe I sell them for $8 a piece, and on and on it goes. They're in the hobby. Uh, let me catch up on some comments. I know it's... Uh, Bob, I like the new logo. Um, let's see here. Uh, doo -doo -doo. I'll have to come back and like actually read some of the comments because I always miss some of the stuff going on when I get carried away. Uh, Gerardo Rivera, hello. So um, the next thing I want to get to is the teaser on the clip in the very beginning, right? So obviously I'm poking fun or poking around the idea that China and the United States, China, uh, that's not, that's, that's not how he says it. Um, you know what I'm talking about. China. I'm going to say it just loud. That's a good impression, right? Uh, so when we do trade with China, um, you end up with 
Do I think? Yeah, I'm a, I'm ignoring you, uh, Betsy and Bob. Sorry, guys. I know you guys are good as as admins. Um, I'll have to read all the terrible things you said about me later. Um, no, you guys rock. Um, so in China, obviously, a lot of our equipment in the in the aquarium trade comes from China. Surprisingly, a lot of our glass is still made in the United States. Yay, go USA. And a lot of tanks are. But if you want ADA stuff, well, that's going to be Japanese. Where is it made? China. Now, that's a whole other weirdo story. Like, they may assemble it in in uh, Singapore or in Japan, but they get glass and raw materials from... Uh... <laughs> yes! Okay. Alan, thank you so much. So Alan just had a $5 super chat. He said, please use this to fill out the UNS. So I've been waiting to get a UNS 90P tank for like four months now. I have the money set aside because you guys rock. And okay, I've, I've paid some rent and stuff. And so now maybe the money's not quite set aside. I still want to go to Aquashella. I'm still waiting on some details of days. And I really want to buy my plane ticket, but I'm waiting to hear back from the organizers. So it's getting a little stressful, but I'll keep that to myself. Um, just because if I'm going to speak or do anything or do a demo or be part of an aquascaping thing, I need to know, be there, and I need to get stuff and be there early and organize things. Uh, and it's coming up at the end of September. Uh, yeah, end of September. So I'm getting stressed on that. But back to what I was talking about, China. So... Basically, a lot of our stuff comes from China. In our houses, if you live in the United States or the Western world, a lot of stuff comes from China, okay? Uh, like it or lump it, you, I would, you know, I love it when there's American-made stuff too, but there are just, um, you know, there's a lot of things that China can make cheaper, and then they get sold at PetSmart, Petco, places like that, Um there's a lot of filters and plastic pieces that are injection molded and, um, you know, the labor to put them together and the, the sheer number of amount of pieces. A lot of things we buy in this hobby, like sponge filters and things, there may be a hundred brands around the world, probably more, that use the same physical sponge filter and there's a spot to, like, press a label onto it or whatever and they sell it out and that's how China does a lot of business you know they have an entire widget factory that makes just the container for this you know or just the castings for these lights ow that's extremely hot um but in the LED the Cree LEDs but uh a lot of them are actually they're getting better and better for years China was always thought of as the, the cheap breakable stuff but now it seems like there's certain, there's levels, you know, because outside uh, in in outside influence has demanded that. Like we're we're gonna pay a little more, but we want better stuff. So you can vote with your dollar and buy whatever you want. Maybe you only want to buy uh, from Dennerle or um, Fluval or Eheim, you know, German and French or Tropica, Denmark, you know, brands, things like that. Um, but there's a good chance you have some Chinese uh, stuff in your place. And uh, a lot of our fish come out of Hong Kong. So a ton of goldfish. I, w I literally four days talked to, four days ago, I talked to um, three people at Tropica, uh, at um, Imperial, and 5D. And then I already talked to Seagrest a while back when I was down there. But almost all... All the fancy goldfish sold that come from overseas are coming out of Hong Kong. Now, when they get inspected, they have a People's Republic of China sticker on there. They go through customs because Hong Kong's in this weird political state. I don't want to get into all of that, but basically it is independent or autonomous for 50 years after 1997. It used to be British and... For now, it's its own territory, kind of like Puerto Rico in the U.S., uh, except even more uh, autonomous. But that means that we have all these British and European people hanging out in Hong Kong, yet they can buy things right across the bridge uh, from these massive farms in China. So it may be that we're dealing with brokers, same with Singapore and Indonesia and Malaysia. Singapore is this 
city state it's it's one city that is the entire nation and they're you know top of the world uh in in exporting things like arowanas and discus and uh goldfish and koi but goldfish and koi obviously you can get them in japan which is great those are very high quality the kind you would see at petco or petsmart they're almost all from either hong kong china or uh, Singapore, uh, places like that, Indonesia. And when we have a trade tariff going with China, I was told that the day sanctions were mentioned or tariffs were mentioned, their cost of goldfish went up 25%. So we have a 25% kind of blanket tariff. Now that doesn't even mean that those companies in China necessarily are paying that tariff yet or have felt the pain but because they don't want to lose money they know they can't go lower than some of the prices that they're at in some of these areas they're already they're getting free electricity from the sun to heat their ponds they're getting water that's local um, and then filtrated and uh, a lot of these big outside ponds you just can't compete anywhere else in the world other than tropical regions and, uh, you know, just like in Florida, that's why 90% of the fish farms for tropical fish in the U.S. are in Florida. There's a few in Texas, a few in California, but they're all in a really warm area. So, how has this changed what's going on in, in the uh, ornamental goldfish world? Well, if you want an Oranda goldfish or, you know, a, a pearl scale goldfish, Unless you're buying them from breeders locally, which in my opinion, that's always best. Always buy from local fish stores and breeders if you can. But these big people, uh, there are really only five companies that run everything. And really, Seagrass, Imperial, 5D, and Wet Spot or uh, Cichlid Exchange are really, that's like, I don't know, 85, 90% of the stuff moving around the country is going through them in some way or another in our tropical uh, freshwater fish. So, all those fish that were being bought from Hong Kong, which shouldn't even be affected by the tariffs, in theory, it's actually they're sourcing it from China, so it is. And then they source it from right across the river, which now there's a bridge, which also a big political thing. Uh, there's a bridge between the two, and those goldfish now are 25% more, if not even more than that, because say... They sell it at 25% more. It's a good time to kind of adjust prices and do things like that and then just blame it on the tariffs, right? Okay. So now, you may have seen this on Aquarium Co-op, now places like Israel that haven't traditionally been known as giant hubs of this, they're not uh, developing, it's not a developing nation for uh, the Israeli citizens, um, Palestinians, you could argue, but there's a big desert with lots of free heat. Uh, water is slightly limited, but they have these huge desalinization plants, which adds a cost, but um, there's an ocean right there, so uh, or a sea. And they're growing crazy amounts of goldfish now. So 5D, Seagrest, these places are now saying, well, before we couldn't buy Israeli goldfish, but now it is uh, too... Uh, you know, like maybe two to five percent difference in pricing, whereas before the Israeli stuff was seen as luxury or maybe just regionally important. And so they've, you know, really upped up their uh, production and maybe the Israelis are willing to let it go. They're, they're willing to let their profit margins sink just a bit. Um, but that video on Aquarium Co-op, I have to say, incredible that Corey went over there with um, and saw all the, the fish and stuff they're doing there. Same with in Texas, the sustainable uh, cichlid farms and things like that. Really cool stuff going on. Um, the point being is that this tariff, which has completely to do with politics in your head and nothing to do with fish tanks, it's going to make your fish tanks 25% more expensive. I said this a year ago on the channel, and I got more hate mail than I've ever gotten up to date to my personal email i've had people find my phone number i even had one guy find my address which it's not that hard if you're 
trying to find things. I'm not a very secretive person, and I've done a lot of things publicly. Uh, but basically, people said, you're bashing our president. You don't know what the F you're talking about. That's not how tariffs work. My point was just that filters and cheap pieces of plastic, uh, cheap, are going to go up. Um, you know, they, they're going to go up. And they have gone up now. And it's not some conspiracy that's what happens during a trade war. So either the tariffs will be lifted and trade will resume um, at a lower cost as it was earlier, or it stays this way and we have new markets opening up. So maybe the Israelis open up goldfish. Well, maybe they live close enough to Iraq or Egypt that they can also find sources for the shrimp. Maybe they start growing babalti shrimp. Maybe the price of babalti shrimp drops and people start keeping them all over the place. There's just all these crazy unintended consequences that you can trace back to the story of each fish as you look in the aquarium. And to me, I was just really, um, really blown away at that. So yes, Cindy425, um, is your 425 because you're in the 425 area code like I am? Uh, I mean, I'm 206 where I live technically, but I have a 425 phone. Um, but yeah, so I was talking to Seagrass and to Imperial, and they were talking about how at the beginning of the year, they are approached by the big box stores. So Petco, uh, PetSmart, those kind of things. Um, they uh, There's a few other regional chains, but basically they talk to all these distributors in Florida. They come down and they say, okay, how much are cherry barbs going to be? Well, they set a price at the beginning of the year, knowing with what they know, and they try to build themselves a little cushion. So maybe it's 20 cents a fish is what they're selling them wholesale to uh, Petco for, and then they retail for three bucks a fish or, or whatever. Um, and they have a lot that die, a lot, that, you know, things go on in the shipping. It, it's, it's not It's not equal as it goes up. It's exponential the way prices work in in trade as as you probably know uh someone's asking what is uns uns is uh ultimate nature systems they do i'll show you You guys need a break from my mug anyhow let's look at some fish while we talk so uh ultimate nature systems they do tanks like this as we call um have uh you know nice clear iron uh low iron glass so the clarity is good so the color's good uh, I know on live streams the color's crap, but um, yeah, so that you can see your aquascape the way it was meant to be seen. But uh, I was supposed to have uh, a friend who was able to get me uh, the UNS uh, 90P, which means 90, centimeter, 90 centimeters across, which is actually the exact size of this table. So the upgrade would be get a new table because this is a 1950s refurbished farm table set that we have that I got at a garage sale for my wife. Uh, and basically uh, this profile and footprint of this, plus it's about this much higher. So we would have a whole big tank. So a 90p... Yeah, it's actually, I think it's bigger than 44 gallons the way they do it. Um, every company uh, does it a little differently, but I want to say, maybe not, maybe it is 44. I, I wanted to say for some reason 52 for some, whatever. It's all done by metric, but the whole point is that um, I was willing to spend around $400 for a rimless aquarium and I thought it would be really cool to have um, a big aquascape to work with rather than the sizes. You know, I did the 40 breeder downstairs, which was a nice size. And we've done this 17.5-gallon. Uh, Isn't it crazy, guys, that the 17.5-gallon still has like a 28 or 39 or 30-inch uh, view? Uh, view? Uh, so it still has like a 75 or 60, no, it's probably 60, 60 centimeter or 70 centimeter front. And the difference of a 90 centimeter, I mean, it like almost triples or quadruples the, the, 
the volume. Um, so in any case, things like the celestial pearl I was talking about at the beginning. I love these fish. They're one of my favorite fish. You see one swimming right here. Um, yeah, there's a little algae in here today. Uh, but those came out of Myanmar, a war zone. The Somfongsi Rasboras, they came out of the, uh, um, uh, the Bangkok drainage, which, uh, means that they were, oh, also Pandagaras, those came out of the Shan region as well, and into Thailand. So, a lot of these fish and plants that we're finding, um, another great example that's from a region of India that was just, it didn't have a lot of foreign travelers, and there's a difference between, okay, you have foreign travelers, but do you have, uh, 48, okay, all right, 48 sounds, sounds correct, Alan, I believe you, Alan, you are a man of, of action, of, of their word, so forth and so on, um, you know what I have here, guys, this is just, just to liven things up a bit, while we're chatting, uh, I have a bunch of mosquito fry that I've been keeping outside. So let's feed, let's feed the little fishies. So, so I'm Fongsy Rasboras tear it up. They just, I mean, they just go for this. My wife hates when I do this because she thinks that the mosquito larvae are going to get away and like end up hatching in our house. And I just laugh because there's no way no way that one can usually even get past the initial onslaught of fish, let alone uh, that they would hide long enough. They have to come to the top to eat or breathe, I should say. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Mosquito larva. Mosquito fry, as I jokingly call them. It makes my wife... Uh, larva sounds like gross and insecty. Whereas fry sounds cute, I think. So they're mosquito fry, guys, if you're having trouble selling the idea of having stagnant ponds. Boom! Celestial Pearl in for the win! Yeah! Now you don't want to feed him uh, mosquito larva all day because, look at that, he's still, he's going to eat it even though it was half the body length. Um, because it's, it's like a lot of protein and it can bind them up and stuff like that. But... Um, Lagandera Miboldi Silver is enough to split soon. Alex, I will send you a portion. Oh, man, I will definitely feature it. So, I have a story to tell you, Alan. Uh, Lagandera Miboldi Silver, I have turned down the intensity on all my tanks, but, uh, I have a Lagandera Miboldi Silver, uh, one star in here. I have also the Lagandera Pink in here, the European Pink. And then I have a red back in here. And obviously the CO2 is not cranked, so you're not seeing all the colors and the lights aren't cranked. I was just sick of the algae algae for now. So let's look over here. I do have the silver me bold eye, logging under me bold eye in here. But wow, not too impressive, is it, when it's at the bottom of a 40 uh, tank? But you can see the silver on it, right? You can see the silver. And then also like... Uh, Let's see, uh, my, uh, th this, uh, white or variegated Anubius, uh, Nana, and then I have also a gold coin, uh, but yeah, so there's a bunch of, uh, plants that I would really like to feature, uh, heavily in my, in a bigger tank, for sure, and so, yeah, anybody who is sending super chats, or, um, S sending super chat. Oh, and this is the Loganandra me bold eye, uh, red or or yeah, red right now. Um, I should add CO two to this tank so you can actually see it. It's not showing up on video, but there's these streaks of bronze all through it, and this thing has gotten huge. I mean, it's just gotten huge. This one just seems to be barely hobbling along. It needs to get more light. Uh, I move the lights around on this tank quite a bit. But, um, yeah, so I wanted to redo that. Also, I set up a shelf just sidetrack-wise. Another place that we should keep an eye on is uh, Indonesia, Borneo, Java. 
uh, Paraguay, or not Paraguay, uh, <laughs> Papua New Guinea, but you can see I've got a lot of different Bucephalandra growing here from little pieces. I just, I'll get a little piece from a friend, something like half of this, and I'll put it on my little shelf here, and I'll just grow it, and, uh, like, this is a brownie ghost here. When hit, light hits it, you'll see the color more. And then a bunch of other species, uh, Katharina, Skeleton, um, Ang uh, Arrogant, Arrogant Blue, right down there, um, whatever. So, yeah, things like these oddball species uh, tend to not be as big of, the con uh, of a conflict issue because they get traded in the high-end, uh, high-end, realm of stuff and customs takes a notice to expensive packages um in corrupt countries a lot of times uh, your package gets swiped also so i've had friends and myself import stuff before uh plants that just don't show up like you just get an empty box basically or you know half of it's there and they take it just because they see the price tag. Um, did I get my CPDs to breed? Yeah, I have a video on that. Cindy, $10 super chat. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. The super chats rock, you guys. Um, they really do. I am, I'm, I, you know what? Okay. Face to face talk. Let's, let's, uh, let's, let's go downstairs and look at the fish down there too. But, uh, oh, I got to grab a couple things. I wanted to mention why China is on my mind. It's like Georgia. China. <laughs> Can I get Elvis hair going? No, that's more like, uh, whose hair is this? This is like weird science or something. Uh, Ed Sheeran. Can I get some Ed Sheeran hair? Or Wolverine? Oh, man, that looks awful. Okay, I need to cut that mop. All right, give me a dollar and I'll cut the mop. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, what I was going to tell you is my parents were just in China. It was really crazy in that um, in China, uh, this is a obviously a replica of the little terracotta. They're not little, they're life-size. But um, terracotta army of thousands of soldiers the emperor took into the afterlife. Also, this was cool. My mom got these from some little girls who were making them on the street in rural China. And uh, these are sunflower seeds with shellac on them, which is kind of cool. They're bracelets. So my wife and I... She brought us back a couple little bracelets. Um, but that's kind of why China's on my mind is my parents were there and I was trying to talk to them. And, you know, they don't have Facebook. They don't have Instagram. They don't have all the stuff we have. And when you try to use it there, it just cuts off. Like, it's just a black screen. They had no idea. Christine, thank you so much for the $5 Super Chat. I really appreciate that. Y'all are Y'all are getting the ball rolling on the Super Chats today. Um, I don't mean to, uh, what should I say? I, it's not a bad thing that not every chat has super chats, but I mean, for some reason, like once someone gets going, man, Alan, Alan, my buddy, <laughs> uh, it seems like we can get stuff done. So the goal is, like I said, with the money, one to get to Aqu Aquashella, uh, it's probably going to be about $700 in all for travel. And obviously none of my videos make anything near to that. Um, but it's a personal event and also, you know, it'll, it helps, um, meet new people, learn new things. And that's what life's about. That's what this channel's about. Um, you know, another thing that I wanted to mention is that the, the price issues with the trade wars going down, um, is that the, the big box stores, they'll say, okay, we want from Seagrest, uh, let's do... Every month we want each store to get uh, 40 cherry barbs and 30 whatevers. Like, make us a contract where you can assure that will happen. And then the store can order less if they need to. Well, they make those prices at the beginning of the year. If a trade war breaks out, all of a sudden, the places they're importing from have a 25% increase. And they've been working with uh, say Petco or whatever, and maybe Petco in their store, they have a thing called a planogram and it's a sketch of 
what fish they're going to feature throughout the year, hopefully, and which seasons, and what goes where, and how much space each store has, and region-wise. And they sit down with uh, the distributors and try to figure that out. So right now, in the country, I thought this was interesting. I'm going to do a whole video on this, but, um, you know, right now, Neon Tetras followed by Cardinal Tetras, those are the two most uh, numerous fish sold, followed by... Um, Let's see here. We've got uh, guppies. That's coming in at number two. Then mollies. And then um, serpe tetras, which surprised me. Serpe tetras. Uh, and then uh, Corydoras aeneas, the albino or the normal. And then um, platies, mollies, and sword tails. Like different variations are like a big chunk of... Uh, the upper part of the top 10 and into the teens of the most sold fish by numbers. It's really hot in my house right now. Um, but yeah, so, you know, if you want to see those big box stores having more diversity and stuff, it's probably, I mean, you can ask them for it, you can demand it, but really you need to get those distributors to have the ability to have, to, to get those things. So, Unless it's being made in the U.S. and under the control of, like, Florida in Florida, then um, you won't be guaranteed of it. And then even in that case, there's a hurricane or something, and it can wipe out a whole farm. I have friends now that I've made that have farms in Florida, and they are out for a whole year. They have they can't fulfill their contracts. The fish all died. And so I think it's important that we realize that a big box store's persona or what they accomplish on their own is something separate from the fish that they source. Uh, the hickeys. Oh, why is everyone asking about the hickeys today? They're not hickeys. This is... I wish they were hickeys. Um, from my mistress, from my wife. No, this is a, a mosquito bite. And then this is a birthmark, if you all haven't noticed before. And this is... He, related aller or allergy related rash of some sort really great you thought you were gonna learn about fish and now you're learning about dermatology um no so the hickey is actually a birthmark um maybe this is why i am and you guys can call bs but go research it i don't want to talk about it i've already said it a million times but when you're a fetus you have gills proto gills uh to help you uh, get oxygen into your blood those go away early on in your fetal development and mine did not my bottom two sometimes women it's usually females uh, they won't go away and they'll have like a little indentation here or on both sides but it's really rare I guess this is the lowest two and it's actually a hole through the skin I don't know if I can if you can see with the light but I can push through my breastplate. Breastplate never developed around that little scar tissue nodule. And so I've had to have two surgeries when I was a little kid and then again when I was 15 um, to, to get rid of the scar tissue in there. So it's like an old organ that doesn't, it does, it's, a, it's a birthmark. They sometimes call them angel kisses. Um, sometimes they call them gills, uh, mermaid gills or something cute like that. But they're basically part of the proto-gill system we have as a fetus and, uh, or like remnant. It's like not useful, obviously. It's not like any fetuses breathe underwater. Um, but yeah, back in our evolution. And again, like people, if you want to argue about evolution on this channel, please, like you're not going to sway me. You're not going to sway the people who are here to learn about um, I mean, you can believe in intelligent design and then that evolution has happened since then or whatever you want to, but, but if you're trying to tell me that evolution doesn't happen, like wrong channel, go somewhere else because you watch it happen. That's what selective breeding and line breeding is about. Like, okay. All right. Rant over. Let's go downstairs. Let's look at some more fishies. We can chat a little more laid back. But my point being is that China, 25 percent increase on goods coming from China. That's a lot. It's going to be a pain, and it is a pain, and 
that may mean that people like UNS or ADA, some of the luxury brands are more within reach. I really want, the thing that I'm really excited about is if I get that 90p, here's what I'm thinking guys. So it's about the footprint of this and a little taller. It's 90, or what is it? So it's uh, 36 inches by 17 inches by 17 inches. So it's taller than this. But, um, yeah, I what I want to do is have kind of, this is so overgrown, guys, forgive me. I do need to rescape this, but I need to get another tank to put all these fish in before I do so. Um, so that's kind of a challenge. Plus, there's some plants. CO2, I took off um, running it every day when I went to Florida just to cut down on the algae, and I've had, like, no algae problems since I let up on the CO2 and the ferts. But this tank is, uh, man, the glare sucks this time of day, sorry. Oh, and the, the koi betta, he's here. Um, in here, this, this is for Betsy. So, see those big spotted, those two danios there? Those are kyathit danios, and they're assholes. Uh, they fight everybody, and they're jerks. Big danios are jerks. Little danios dream of being jerks, but they're just not big enough to be, uh, successful at their jerkiness um you know i've got in here a lot of these corridoras that have just like i'll just see a baby in there a baby corridor corridora and it'll just go nuts yeah alan you're right i could just use a rubbermaid and do that um maybe i will do that um but yeah that betsy that's for you i know you said you wanted to declare war on them also, I want to put red cherry shrimp in this tank, even though it has, like, garamis and danios and bigger stuff. But it's so dense right now that, like, the red cherry shrimp I threw in there as a trial are doing super well. A few have gotten picked off, but I think that they'd be fine in how dense this vegetation has become. Uh, let's see here if we can look at some of the stuff. But China made... This is laser printed, uh, which is great. So, or I mean, 3D printed. So Han at Han Aquatics, 3D printing can really actually help us uh, stop our reliance on China so much because a lot of widget suction cups, things like that, you just kind of have to get them from China because they're just like mass produced there. And when they come from the US, they cost an arm and a leg. Um, this is another new, this is the gold nebulous uh, golden nebula shrimp from aquatic arts so those are in there too um testing them out you can see i've got some baby um uh pseudomagill luminatus in there there's also some baby erythromicron and baby uh what are they called cpds the thing i was talking about earlier celestial pearls living somewhere under this tangle of madness you'll see them dart by and yada yada they're in there um but other than that this tank has kind of just gone feral a little bit even though there's some really nice rare plants in there it's like the limnophilia bellum and the um limno and uh you know butterfly and um fricata uh uh sorry what's it called um, drawing a blank. We're going to not worry about it. All right, so over here, my next project, too, that I need to get figured out is these Honduran red points that I raised from the point when they were little teeny bitsy baby, uh, like eyelash size fry. Okay, they're getting big, and they're becoming buttheads. They're just not chill at all. They have eaten almost all the baby uh, endlers. And for some reason, the, the males must just look like little flashy lures with their tails. Because my uh, Japanese blue slash, uh, I started calling them voltas, the line that they're in their uh, 13th generation in here. They're just getting eaten quickly. As this, these, there's two in particular uh, males that have just grown really quickly out of the five of them. And so they need a new place to go, definitely. Up here, everyone always says, what's with the broken glass, dude? Well, the broken glass is the best thing that's happened to this tank. 
The babies need surface area, and with this new Babalti strain that I have that turns all the different colors, um, see, even there's a baby that's orange and a dad that's kind of green with some orange in its uh, shoulder where its guts are. But, um, yeah, so these, these guys have tons and tons of little baby shrimp, but they don't eat like shrimp food they're like not like neo caradina they really really need a uh, grazing area and 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 mulm like dirty surface areas and so you can see his whole digestion tract is full right there and so he is eating and doing well he's doing great he's doing his little thing um so yeah, these guys are doing well. The the new Babaltis, these are not the neon green Indian Babaltis from Aquatic Arts. These are another uh round of Babalti uh Caradina Babalti that have ended up being something else. And I actually have been talking to Chris Lukomf uh trying to figure it out. The fry are eating um they're eating not algae, but I thought it was algae at first, but no, they want uh the that thin layer of of slime that, that develops on stuff when it's in a, a low TDS tank. You see that kind of like gummy or it, like if you touch your glass in your tank and it feels slimy, the uh that's what they're eating. And then you can see the difference between the Neo Caradina um, Sakuras. These guys are so yellow. It is bonkers. My wife just got home. Hello, wife. Hi. She says, hi, guys. Um, but yeah, so those, uh, Babaltis, you see they have a flatter head, they've got a serrated rostrum or nose, like, up top here, it, if you look at it perfectly square on, they've got a little zigzag, plus they have way more whiskers, and then they have, like, a wood grain dotted pattern if you look at them. So I'm really in love with these guys. Their babies take a long time to grow up, and they lay them as larval shrimp, not as fully formed. Uh, I think that's like, technically they're not, but they're so small that they're, they're like smaller than baby brine shrimp when they hatch. So no fish can be in here. There's not a single fish that is friendly with them uh, whatsoever. Whereas the the um these guys they just i mean they're fine with fish i've got them with fish in a bunch of tanks uh but they're hanging out i also uh have been taking all the planaria with um uh with that same suction tube that i was using to feed the fish upstairs i've been taking the planaria out of the tank and uh when i see them swimming like somewhere in the debris here which i know i need to leave because Look at all of the little babies and youngins foraging. And right now I've probably got four or five generations in here. But some of them are so stinking teeny. I'm super zoomed in right now. Broken glass seems to uh, grow that that slick slime layer better than anything. And then they'll, they'll eat it. I'll wipe it off. I'll throw it back in. And you can see this, this nice slime layer. So I basically just up the level of surface area. And honestly, they weren't reproducing the last or the first six months I got them. Sorry, guys, the zoom on the f on the um, the gimbal when it's off is really odd. But um, yeah, uh, in any case, the the babies are super teeny, and uh, these are the ones that are probably Iraqi or um, you see how teeny those guys are. So they remain the size of the Neo Caradina babies for probably up to three months. And you just don't see them. And then all of a sudden they appear again. There's one that's a yellow color um, that's not the Neo Caradinas. Like I said, you can tell up close which are which. It's a little difficult um, on film or from far away if you're not really well versed in it. They're much more sensitive though. I don't think they see very well and they've got these whiskers that really allow them to see or feel vibrations in the water. So they move when something enters the tank on the other side of the tank, they'll move the opposite direction. It's kind of crazy. Uh, but they're really fun. Uh, Aquatic Arts has uh, or had them. I hope they get more back. Um, and obviously you guys know on this channel I got lots of... Uh, Lots of uh, coupons, and we're doing giveaways. We're doing 
over a thousand dollar in gift giveaways from aquaticarts.com no purchase necessary in here we have Malawa shrimp um which are caradina species they're hanging out but i'm worried these guys are going to eat them real quick like any week now so the plan i think for now maybe some of the Malawas are big enough that they're okay uh it's interesting, the Malawas have turned different colors in every tank I have. The plan for now, though, is to put those cichlids down into this tank, which is my quarantine tank, and then uh, I'll make room for them somewhere else. Like, make a more predatory tank. Maybe that 40 upstairs is where they'll go. But I've got a glut right now of these guys. Um, and they I just fed them before we went live. But I just thought that this video, I would end it on kind of a happier note and than on world politics. But I want you guys to think about the, the news. Like, watch the news and think how it affects things. I mean, okay, German, uh, almost certainly Chinese foam, Chinese tube, Chinese air tubing. These are all definitely Chinese. All these filters I have pre- so, like I leave them in there to get pre-cycled uh, as long as I don't have company or anything I'll just leave them in tanks cycling uh, and then I run uh, hang off the back sometimes and other times not like when I'm trying to get my plecos to spawn I'll run that hang off the back and I'll turn the heat down uh, but right now I got plenty of green dragon pleco uh, youth hanging out I'm surprised Pop's not in his normal den but I'm going to try to get these fancy fin plecos to spawn soon. There's there's some in the tank behind me, the bigger 40. Um, and then, obviously, everybody's favorites. The uh, the blue dream neocaridinas. And the snails. And the snails. No, and the pandaloaches. So pandaloaches is a great fish to end this uh discussion on in that uh they come from one area in china and see there are baby shrimp there's some really itty bitty babies you see that little blue dot on the wall that's a baby shrimp um oh yeah aqua balls uh the the earthquake in in um california yeah i hope everybody's fish rooms are okay who's living down there that is a scary thing um my tanks i would be in trouble if there was a big earthquake uh i need to actually prepare myself a little bit better for that here um in my in my uh lab in my laboratory um i'm also actually i i'm so uh finicky about this but when i see a shrimp that needs to be cold i will do so as soon as I see them because sometimes with shrimp you're just like where did it go and you never see it again so for me that's not good enough quality blue you see that the back part of it it's like kind of grayish these guys if I if I take two that are about like this color they will uh inevitably end up with blue Riley or really shrimp so it's kind of interesting. I do have a video I did about how to take care of fish when the power is out um, or when the electrical grid goes down. Also, this is really good for me to see. I'm seeing a bunch of baby shrimp that um, had been hiding back in here. Some of them are super, super teeny, which it, I love to see those babies. See, see that little baby right there on the please don't get eaten. Is it going to get eaten? Nope. So I'm almost positive that these panda loaches are not eating a single one of the baby shrimp. I think they only want the algae pellets I, I, I feed them. Yes, these uh, panda loaches are of breedable age now. I am happy to say, unlike last season, this season I got my hands on some, and it's been six months now. I got them as adults. Now they're totally adults. I got them from the lower river. Hey, Ginger, what's up? I got them from the lower uh, tributary of the river, uh, which is in the national park, uh, in the river they live on. And that means that uh, basically, um, will pandaloches eat tiny snails? Um, honestly, I haven't seen them eat 
anything. They don't seem to eat baby brine shrimp. They don't seem to eat vinegar eels. Um, they'll filter through it and spit it back out, but they seem to want algae and alfuchs. Like, that's it. Like, right now they're going after a piece of algae wafer, like spirulina. Uh, I think, I mean, they, they'll, I've, I have seen them eat a planaria. See, there's a planaria right there. Let's see if it eats it. Um, I thought for sure that they'd be eating some of these baby neocaridina shrimp, but honestly, I just haven't seen I don't know if I keep them full and they're just... They're just not an aggressive fish, but maybe if they weren't fed and they had those baby neocaridinas in front of them all day, every day, they would do that. But yeah, they really want biofilm. And so what I do is I'll take these rocks and I'll put them in another tank and I'll let them get all slimy and green and stuff. And then I'll throw them in this tank. And uh, the thing that this tank doesn't have going on right now, which I'm going to do probably either in the summer or the fall, uh, probably the end of summer, uh, because that's their natural time to, to, um, to one of their spawns. I tried it in the spring and it didn't work. They weren't old enough. But now that there's a colony of 10 that all love each other, they're all adults and you know, the babies, you can go back and see my old videos when they're babies they have black and white lines, like black and white, black and white, black and white, and super solid dark black and super solid white. Now, half of the species actually turns a buttercream more like, um, like these rocks on the white part, and on the black part, it's like this color, like a translucent-y brown. So one one branch of the the river they live in they only live in one river system in the world that we know of um but one branch of that river they color up like this and the other they color up like brown and i separated my browner ones are upstairs so there's three browner ones upstairs but these these 10 are all from the lower river and um some people have argued they may be a different species because they've been separated so long and there's like intense waterfalls all along it. But um, yeah, these guys are fully adults and I love their patterns. So many people complain, oh, they get old and they they don't have the, the patterns. I think these patterns, the males have these crazy head patterns and I think they're incredibly beautiful. And they're just so cute. They just dog pile on with each other. At night for bedtime, they all just hang out on that rock. And then the, the biggest males will go hang out up here and kind of survey their, their perch. Females will go hang out, just have a female party back in the Sawasar Tong. I don't know what they're doing. And then the males just come out and graze um, in different areas. And don't they seem to stay lower than the highest male is in the tank. So, like, if, if there's the alpha male... Sorry about the glare. So... Either he or... Where'd he go? There was another one. Oh, back up in here. Are the alpha male in the tank? I think. And the other ones seem to stay lower in the water than him, which is interesting. But the males... The females have these more plain heads like this here. Um, and technically a little wider belly and less big um, floppy f uh, fins. They're pectoral fins. Whereas this guy, the male... He's got these big old floppy fins that he can actually uh, come out and climb like up a stick. If I put a stick in there, they'll sometimes kind of shimmy up it to eat algae for a few seconds and then they flop off back into the water. But they, the males have this cool head pattern. You see it? But the, the bummer about these is that I think they're being poached. And there's no way to know for sure other than going there and finding out. But I think the males are being poached in it for the hobby. And um, that's a bummer. So I really think it's important that uh, if you get a hold of these guys, uh, Aquatic Arts gets some from a source that uh, that is uh, definitely not poached. It's one of the few that have a license to get them. Uh, but they're usually babies, but if they're adults, you can assume they're actually not poached because when they get poached mostly is when they're brand new babies and, uh, they, they spawn and they're in these little areas and at night they all sleep together in a pile. 
Um, and so when they sleep together in the pile, it's, uh, it's, you can come in with a net and catch like a thousand babies at once. Um, because there aren't that many fish in this river. It's a very fast river. So to get them to breed, what I'll do is I'll drop the temperature down to like 60 degrees or 58 degrees probably. They're at 72 currently. And uh, I'm going to get power heads and also do a water change a day of 50%. So we'll see how that goes. Right now I'm letting it act as though they're in one of the little side streams of the river and they're just hanging out um getting having a nice warm summer fattening up on things um and all that stuff um so yeah but i'm really happy this is the first day literally that i'm seeing these little teeny baby some of these really young like born last night that one uh shrimp out and about and they are not being predated at all by the panda loaches. So that's great. Panda loaches, I love them. I would do a whole channel on them if someone would watch. I might do like an hour-long live stream of them just to music one of these days. Just because they're... Or not live stream, but video. So you could see the full color. And just their interactions are really funny. Sometimes one will come up and... They'll all smell it, and then they'll all run away from it, or I, I, they just behave funky. But the males get these, the alpha male gets these giant fins. Um, and this is, I'm just working this out. I might be wrong, but from what I can tell, these are the alpha males. And they get these big old fins, and they do daring stuff like come up to the top here and try to eat off the dry part of the tank. But they don't seem to jump ever. So in any case... Those are coming out of China exclusively. Nobody's been able to breed them in mass uh, for the hobby yet. And that's something that I'm working on. A bunch of Germans are working on. And yeah, we're all just trying to figure out if there's a way to do that so that we don't need to, so that we don't encourage any poaching. I'm not going to buy any from any source. Other than the three licensed sources that work with the Chinese government and actually get them out of the park and they're given a quota uh, and they sell through uh, Singapore and then also through Germany, like they'll end up in Germany. But um, yeah, you can see what is going on. Her saddle is so weird looking. I wonder if those eggs are rotten. Hold on. Her saddle is, well, now they're shrimp they're being shrimp they're being all shellfish and fighting each other here's one turning a, a sun-kissed orange color right now it was just green and now it's going to turn yellowy orange but yeah babaltis real easy even though they're a caradina they're not like they're they're almost identical to the neo caradina to take care of the them the live adults but don't put them with fish if you want any babies. Their babies are itsy bitsy teeny weeny polka dotted yellow babies. And um, they, yeah, they won't grow up. So um, that's about all I have for today, guys. Unless anybody has any burning questions about trade wars and um, uh, Keynesian economics versus Austrian economics. Um, if you got that. Or if you think that's funny, shame on you, you're a nerd. Um, so, yeah, I'll have another live stream that uh, coming out soon. I feel like I've been slacking on some of the live streams. I'll get my gimbal back out. So I know I've been, I've been a little shaky with the filming because I've been using my gyro and my tripod. Man, my hair is just like, it's so humid in here. The hair is just frizzing out. Uh Oh, and hickeys. Yeah, I'll, I'll be back with lots more of my hickeys. I'd rather people think they're hickeys than, like, poison oak or something, you know? Um, I have them in a small aquascape, 10 gallons at two. Uh, oh, Battis with uh, two galaxy reservoirs and two algae eaters. Cool. Um, yeah, man, wouldn't it be cool to have an aquascape with, like, I don't know, a hundred of the panda loaches spawning in there, like a hill stream cell. No, what I want to do in the 90p, my, my thought is 
if you see my Instagram, I did a, uh, I did a, um, broken arch at one point in Aquascape, and it looked like a diamond in the center, so there's mountains going up on either, hold on, let me set this down so this isn't shaking like, a chihuahua, alright, whoa, almost lost, almost lost myself, okay, so, two slopes like this, my face is in the center of the tank, um, two slopes going up, and then this goes to the back, and in the back there's a wall of whatever, some sort of uh, stem plant. And then mid-tank, there's a broken arch. So two pieces of stone that come like this, and then like a couple key pieces that like looks like they broke and fell in a pattern. And then behind that, a few jagged uh, pieces that stick up. So maybe rock intensive, probably get it down to a 30-gallon tank or something like that and I'll probably build it up tiered like a stadium. So if you would like to see that, I mean, it's stuff like that, that um, the Patreon, uh, when people do that, even for a dollar, you know, give 12 bucks, support the channel for a year, a buck a, ch a thing. I decided I'm gonna redo my Patreon a little bit and that I'm gonna start giving, um, because people have been asking like for me to help troubleshoot their tanks and I've been texting back and forth or emailing back and forth with people and sometimes it's a lot of hours um, of my day and uh, I really want to help people uh, and I will continue to help people when I have time but I think I'm going to try to do it so that if you are a Patreon that automatically anything, maybe even a dollar, I'll, I'll help you anytime that you message me as soon as I can get to it I'll help you and if you give you know, five or more a month on Patreon, I will, like, 24-7, if it's at night, it won't be, like, when I get to it in the week, it'll be, like, when I see it, if I have time, I'll answer it, and there's a few of you, Betsy, um, who are like that already, that we chat, and, uh, you know, when stuff's going on, I have a second, I'll try to give my input, or check it out, but, um, you know, if your fish is sick or something like that, like I want to offer uh, quality to you guys in the Patreon, but I also want to um, assure a little bit of income uh, because the ads are so finicky on YouTube and stuff like that. And I hate overloading the ads or always pairing with aquatic arts or things like that, because that's really just a way for me to get reduced price fish and shrimp like those, uh, like a lot of my CPDs and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, what are the fish you pointed out, the bigger males, uh, eating the fry? Oh, the Honduran red points, the, the cichlids? Yeah, they're, they're convict cichlids. Uh, my Instagram is linked somewhere on my YouTube page, I think, but it is, uh, I haven't been using it as much, but here's the deal, guys. If I see people interested in the Patreon and if I keep seeing videos growing like some of these recent ones have with like a lot of views, I'm gonna do this more full time than my graphic design. And so I'll be really trying to make some better quality videos and uh, or more heart, more research. Not that all my videos don't have, you know, something like that going on, but I mean, I, like I want to take it up a level for you guys. And also just provide something that's not out there, that in-depth, long form, I'll probably do some short form like troubleshooting videos more too, and top tens that are kind of fun, but I want to do at least one like good historic dive video a week, and then one top ten type video a week, and then one live stream a week, and then anything extra is whatever. But that's the goal. If you like what I'm doing, um, you can support me that way or just by watching. I know not everybody has, you know, a dollar a month to spare or have another bill. I get I get it. You know, you guys all do things. A lot of you guys contribute so much like, um, you know, Bob and Betsy that it helped me out with with uh, digitally running stuff and all that uh, stuff. So a lot of you help out or send me little samples of stuff, which is always cool. If, if it's something I genuinely like, enjoy, and think other people should check out, uh, I'm for that. Like, I'm, I'm shamelessly saying I will do product placement, uh, if it's a good, useful product. I'll try it out and figure it out. 
Uh, but other than that, I, I want to just get back to the history, the bigger picture, and all that sort of stuff. Um, no, he said they were getting bigger, two males, and he needed to go somewhere else. Yeah, the the, the Jack Dempsey looking guys, those are Honduran Red Point uh, youth. Um, but yeah, um, they're convict. They're a type of convict cichlid. They'll get red dots on them. Uh, but yeah, thanks, Bob. I, I like the history videos too. Quite honestly, um, I want to think of a more engaging way where I can get people who maybe aren't into history and politics and things like that to... It's not about the story necessarily here, like in the hobby or this one story. Like today we covered a couple weird stories. My whole point was not to teach you about anything about Myanmar, but to show you just the way we remove ourselves from uh, the hobby and from what's going on and... Um, everything in life. So it's we're talking about a fish tank because it's a hobby that I love and know, and I feel like it's a way to communicate people who are already passionate about this. But it's about you know thinking uh, global, acting local. That whole uh, slogan, whether you're right wing or left wing, we can all get behind that. I think to support those of us breeding and making things locally that are of good quality, and um, trying to help out those. Uh, who need it or exporting our well-made stuff to other places and breeding and selling to other breeders trading um, bartering rather than always just buying this disposable filters that break in a month or heaters that break so that's all I had to say today that's all that's all that's just an hour and a half of ranting and rambling thank you guys so much for um, you know uh, watching as somebody just said the electric bill five hundred dollars um, you know uh, yeah in Seattle the electric is insane several hundred uh, at least at least three or four hundred dollars for two months um, plus water and everything else so that's you know the patreon goes towards that aquatic arts has really helped me use less of the patreon money to get fish and stuff because they've allowed me to buy fish for cost and things like that so that's cool um, that's helped, and I hope you guys feel okay that I'm promoting them in that I get to bring in cool, interesting new little fish, but uh, I also get a bit of your time to uh, say that. Also do giveaways, like we're giving over a thousand bucks away. Uh, I'm going to pick someone after this live stream uh, in the comments, so if you want to comment something about this video or share it or whatnot, um, I'm going to pick someone in the comments to get free shipping from Aquatic Arts. So that's uh, over a $40 value. It ships anywhere in the contiguous United States. Uh, if you're not in the contiguous United States, uh, don't participate in the commenting, please. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you can say you're just not in the contiguous. And then I'll do a random number thing. Or if somebody can tell me a fact about history or fish... Uh, that blows my mind. I might just look, make them win right away. All right, guys. Uh, take care. I will talk to you later. Somebody recommends solar power here. Uh, I live in Seattle, so uh, it rains 200 days a year or something like that. We do. Solar would be somewhat helpful, in, in but the initial investment for me is too much at the moment. But someday, I mean, if uh, Patreon ended up being 500 a month, I'd totally spend like you know, a couple hundred, uh, you know, a couple thousand on that, but no problem. Bob, thanks for sharing, buddy. Thank you for the super chats today, guys. Y'all rock. Uh, if you have questions, concerns, comments, just leave them, uh, and I will talk to you guys uh, later. Of course, I have more history videos coming. I have a bunch in the works, plus my video from Florida. Uh, I still am editing and just playing around with the right time to release what, or if I can tie it into another thing, so uh, that's all. All right, guys, take care. Have a wonderful day, and I will talk to you later.